All right, welcome everybody. We're gonna go uh, just real quick through uh, chapter 30. And chapter 30 is all about induction. And uh, so without further ado, I guess we can just jump into what induction actually means uh, in a physical context. So the idea is actually a relatively straightforward one. If you have, say, a loop of wire like this, and there's a magnetic field that's sort of some external magnetic field that's going through the loop of wire. So imagine this loop of wire is kind of perpendicular to my page here. What happens is, uh, as in this current picture, actually, nothing spectacular happens. There's just a magnetic field. We have this closed loop of wire that is sitting in the magnetic field. What is strange that happens, it's a, it's a little bit of a wonky concept, but it's pretty straightforward uh, as far as the theory goes, uh, is that if the magnetic field were to change that is going to cause a change uh, within the loop, and that change will be a current that's going to flow. So if a magnetic field, the external magnetic field changes, then a current will flow through our loop. That's the entirety of the theory of this uh, chapter, and there will be a few different equations and a few different devices which make use of this. Um, the one thing that I will mention first is that it's not strictly just magnetic field, it's actually magnetic field times the area of the loop. And if you recall, going back to our first unit on electricity, when we had a field times an area that was related to the flux. So we are going to have a magnetic flux now. And the magnetic flux will, will just be B times A for the purposes of this chapter. Uh, if you recall that flux is the integral of B dotted with DA um, from electricity, um, we're not actually gonna use that, we're just gonna use sort of this simplified version for the flux. The reason is because we're going to define our uh, induced current, we'll actually define the induced voltage, which we're going to call the EMF, and that induced voltage is going to be related to the time derivative of this flux. So we'll have the EMF is equal to, uh, it'll be the, the, I just want to make sure it's a, the negative time derivative. Um, yeah, well, okay, we're, we're going to end up using it within absolute values anyway, because it's going to be a, 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 uh, but for now we'll just go ahead and write this. So it's the negative time derivative ddt of the magnetic flux. Okay, so we're going to do a few different things with this equation. We're going to use this to f calculate the magnitude of the EMF, which is again a voltage that is induced in the loop. And then since we have a voltage in the loop, you could have a resistor with the loop and you could do uh, voltage is equal to IR, you could do that kind of thing. On the other side of this equation, uh, then we're actually gonna have two different things. We're gonna have a sign here. This negative sign is gonna tell us something important that defines a thing called Lenz's Law, which tells us the direction uh, that the current flows in the loop, which we'll get to in a few problems. And then the other thing, of course, is the actual calculation of the magnitude, which, which is gonna come down to taking a time-based derivative of B times A. So we're gonna have some examples where the B changes, some examples where the A changes. For our first problem, it's actually just the flux itself that's going to change. So problem number one, they just give you an equation for the magnetic flux with respect to time. And you are asked to find, first of all, the magnitude of the EMF uh, at a certain time. Well, for that one, that's actually um, a, a pretty straightforward calculation. We can find the magnitude. It'll be the absolute value of the EMF. And that'll be equal to just the time-based derivative of the magnetic flux equation that's given. So you just take a derivative, just a power rule derivative. I'll put absolute values here, too. You just do power rule derivative and plug in the time, and that'll give you the magnitude of the EMF. There's no constants or anything out here, it's just B times A, which in this case, though, we don't even need to do B times A because it's already a flux. The second part is they ask for the direction, and this is where the negative sign out in front of uh, Faraday's law comes into play. This negative sign right here tells us something called Lenz's law. And the way this actually works is that you would have um, a magnetic field through a current. So let's say I have a loop in the plane of the page and I have a magnetic field that is coming out of the page. We'll call this our B external. 
What's going to happen is, in order to get the direction of the current, we need to use a sort of intermediary here called the induced magnetic field. And what's going to happen is when the magnetic field external changes, the, uh, there will be an induced magnetic field that will make up for the change. So if B external were to increase in magnitude, if it's getting more powerful coming out of the page, that means that there will be a B induced that would be into the page. So that would be your B induced. If B external were getting weaker, um, in that case, you would have a B induced that needs to make up for the loss in external magnetic field, and so B induced will point in the direction of B external. So take a look at an example in just a second, but what I just want to mention is that B induced, this little intermediary here, this is going to be the thing that will give us the direction for the current using a right-hand rule. You point your thumb in the direction of B induced, and then wrap your fingers around. So my thumb is into the page, my fingers wrap around in this direction. So that tells me the direction for this one in particular. This is also uh, the same setup uh, for this problem. Once you get the direction for the current, then you can, you can uh, find the direction for the current through the resistor, which is just at the bottom of that loop. All right, uh, problem number two, they give us a, a, an application problem and uh, they give you actually an equation for the EMF. They've already done the, the derivative of the flux, and they're just going to give you an equation. They just ask you to do a little calculation with the equation where you're just equating the coefficient on that first sign to the coefficient on the second one, and so that tells you that the epsilon naught has to be equal to 2 pi f times nab times big B. And the one thing that I'll mention here is that you're solving for NAB as a single variable. So you just need to plug in epsilon naught, the frequency, and the magnetic field, and then you can just isolate this whole term. And that's actually the entirety of that problem. Um, cool, all right, problem number three is a very common application of Faraday's law. This is the moving uh, bar problem. So you have, uh, bar, 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 and then you have this, this you have, I guess you call those rails, and then we have a bar that is moving along the rails. So all of this stuff is made out of metal, right? So we have a complete loop right here that current could flow through, and we need the area of that loop, and that area is just going to be, say, a length times a width, and um, the uh, length would be the length of the blue bar as I have it drawn and so I'll go ahead and leave that and here it set, it'll say that the rail separation that's another way of saying the, the length of the bar so this is going to be the rail separation the width is a strange one because the width is actually going to vary as this guy moves with the velocity v to the left or to the right the width can be measured from here you could say that this is x equals zero, and it'll go out to x equals some x value. Um, and so we can represent the width then as just like a delta x, is what you could think of it as. So our area equation then would just be like length times a delta x, however far the bar has moved from the right side. And Great, so now when I go to calculate the, the uh, I think we want to do the EMF, and I think we're ultimately actually going to do some stuff with the resistance. So we will use ultimately V equals IR, because remember our electromotive force, or EMF, is another word for the voltage. So uh, we need to relate that EMF to the uh, negative time derivative of the, the magnetic flux as we know. And again, we're going to do magnitude. We can, uh, I think we, we will have to find a direction maybe. No, actually, we don't even have to do a direction here. So we're not going to worry about the negative sign and the induced magnetic field in this problem. Um, we can just do absolute values. Anyway, so for our flux then, what do we plug in for flux? As, as I mentioned back at the beginning, it's always going to be B times A. So I'll have the time derivative of B times A. And then the question that you ask yourself is, well, which thing is varying here? Is the magnetic field varying? Actually, we're in a constant magnetic field with a constant magnitude pointing out of the page. So the magnetic field will not be variable with time. And so we can pull the magnetic field out front and we'll just be left with the area. Now I have an expression for the area right here that I can plug in. 
So I pull my magnetic field out front, and then I have a DDT times the area, where the area is length times delta x. And I'm running out of room just a little bit, so I'm just going to sort of uh, finish this up over here. Uh, the length is also a constant, so we can also pull the length out front. And then we have dx dt left over. So it'll just be uh, b l dx dt. And then what is dx dt? Well, that is just from physics one, week one, that is just the definition of uh, velocity. So our EMF for the sliding bar problem is always going to be b l v. And you're allowed to just sort of have that equation in your notes. And you can just write right next to that equation, sliding bar problem. That allows you to do different things with this. Uh, in, in this particular problem, we have to find the EMF. Then we have to set it equal to IR, plug in a resistance to find the current. And then they also ask you about the rate that energy is being transferred to thermal energy. It's a little convoluted thing, but we know the rate of energy change is always power. So just as a reminder, power with a resistor is I squared R. And so that's the equation that you'll use. Um, you could also do V squared over R with the EMF right here. Um, if you'd like, those should give you the same answers in both cases. All right, next problem. Problem number four here. In problem number four, we are um, asked to investigate the electric field um, in this circular region. And uh, we have a magnetic field, and then we're given an electric field through the circular region. And in this case, we're actually sort of expanding uh, the EMF side of Faraday's law. So we have that Faraday's law, epsilon is equal to negative uh, DDT of the magnetic flux. And on the right hand, on the left hand side rather, we can also set the EMF equal to uh, the path integral of E dotted with ds, the path length. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, so if you, if you integrate uh, integral of E dot ds, that has to be also equal to the time derivative of the magnetic flux. Now, taking a step back here, what is going on with the physics? All that we're saying is that this EMF is, it has to be related to an electric field that is induced inside the current. That's how you get or induced inside the wire. The way you get a current to flow in a wire to go back a few, like a month or so, the way you get current to flow through a wire is because there's an electric field inside of that wire. So that's all this is saying is this is just relating it back to the electric field. All right, so in this problem then, um, we have the, uh, yeah, the, the, that uh, integral of E dotted with ds. It's a circular region, so that's actually just going to be E times 2 pi r on the left-hand side, and then of course we have the EMF as sort of the intermediary here, but we're just going to equate the left side to the right side. On the right-hand side, then, um, I know that I'm going to have the uh, negative time-based derivative of uh, the flux, which is the time, oh, we're going to put an absolute value here and relate all these absolute values. Okay, so, uh, because we know that, again, that negative sign is Lenz's law, so if we ever need to do direction, we know that. All right, so just as we did in the last problem, we're going to replace our flux with B times A. So we have DDT of B times A. And then the question is, which thing varies? On the last problem with the sliding bar, it was the area that varied. In this problem, it will be the magnetic field that is going to vary. So the area is actually constant because it is a circular region of radius R. So we actually have E times 2 pi R on the left side. On the right side, our area is just going to be pi R squared. And then we just have db dt. And then they gave you a function for db dt that you can go ahead and take the derivative of and plug it in right there. And ultimately, in this problem, you're asked to solve for uh, a, which is going to be the, um, the slope of the magnetic field graph. And what you'll get is you'll, you'll solve for, say, uh, the ratio of e to r, so if you divide, you know, divide your pi out and divide by r, you'll get e over r on the left hand side. You want to move that two over to the right hand side, but you'll end up with e over r. And the reason why e over r is valuable is because you can read this off of the, the graph that they give you. So this is just the slope of that graph. 
and then you'll have this equal to the time-based derivative divided by that 2 right there. And we know the time-based derivative is that constant a, and then you can solve for a in terms of the slope of the electric field graph. So again, you have two different fields. They're both going to be variable. The magnetic field varies with the function that is given. The electric field varies according to that graph. And then you just read the slope inside of the radius r. All right, so this is inductance. We've, we've just very quickly run through our definition for inductance, which is just uh, the uh, electricity that is induced inside of a current, uh, or inside of a wire, rather. Um, and then we can now finally formulate our uh, device that is called an inductor. So we've come back around several times to this idea of a coil of wire where you have a certain number of loops and I mentioned that the reason that we keep going back to this coil of wire is because ultimately we're going to plug this into a circuit uh, and now we're going to go ahead and do that and we're going to build something called an inductor and an inductor has an inductance L why do we have to use L? because we used I for current so now inductance has to be L um, and so inductance, this is similar to, uh, to CF. I don't remember exactly what that stands for. It's like compare, I think it might be French. Anyway, the point is compare this to capacitance and resistance, okay? So inductance is just a, a, our last sort of piece. You have a capacitor, you can have a resistor, and here we'll have an inductor. And inductance has units of Henry's, And we're going to have all sorts of equations. Now, the first thing that we did in uh, um, in capacitance, I think, was to talk about like the actual construction of a capacitor with a parallel plate capacitor. Where you have like the plate separation in the area, and so on and so forth. Um, we're going to have a few different things that we're going to calculate with the inductance. For the first problem, uh, you're asked to find the you actually have a, a, an inductor that's a weird thing. Like they form it out of a sheet tube that has a current flowing around it. Um, but the equation that you just need to use, you just need to calculate the magnetic field, and the equation is the magnetic field is mu naught little n times, uh, uh, mu naught little n times i. Um, and, yeah, this is just a general equation. Little n is turns per unit length, so our unit length here, this is by definition, turns over length. Our length in this case is given as like a W. The only other thing that you need to keep in mind is because the because it's a sheet and we have this whole current flowing down the sheet, um, you need to divide the current that they give you by the number of turns. So we actually want to, for just for this problem, we want to replace this current with current divided by n, the number of turns. Um, the little n will always be turns per unit length. So just sort of differentiating those two by having them in a different color. And uh, yeah, and you can just plug in and solve with the given quantities there. Uh, mu naught is still that constant, 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. Um, and then the other thing they ask us to do is to calculate the actual inductance. So this is one other equation that we have that we'll use with inductors, and that's that the number of turns times the magnetic flux is equal to um, L times I. So L is our inductance, I is the current. If you have a current flowing through an inductor, the entire point of this is if I try to change this current that's flowing through the inductor, what's going to happen is the inductor will, uh, the magnetic field that is produced by that current through this inductor, this magnetic field right here that we calculated, when that changes, the inductor will produce its own induced magnetic field that'll have a direction according to Lenz's law, and that induced magnetic field will thus continue to pump out current. So this is the, the second equation that we have, uh, and then for the flux, uh, for part B in, in this specific problem, um, you replace your flux again with B times A, and then for A, that's just going to be the cross-sectional area, it's just the area of that tube essentially, which is going to have a radius R, so it will actually be B times uh, pi times big R squared, and your magnetic field you will have found with this equation on the left hand side. You just go ahead and plug that in there. All right, um, let's see if we're going to do an inductance problem with an actual coil. Yeah, we, we do have one. Uh, problem number six 
has, uh, it just gives you a graph with a current versus time, and you could probably tell they're going to ask you to calculate the induced EMF through all of these um, little sections. Well, this is just uh, the, uh, so, uh, the definition for the um, EMF or the voltage that's used up by an inductor. So remember, we have a couple different voltages so far. We have a voltage of a capacitor, which is Q over C. We have the voltage of the resistor, which is I times R. And the last one that we need now is the voltage um, in the inductor. So this will be the epsilon sub L. This is the self-induced EMF. And this is going to be equal to uh, L di dt. Now we technically put a negative sign on it. Um, and to be quite honest, there was also an implicit negative sign on these because they also use up voltage. So that's nothing new. You're just going to see that in the equation. Um, typically, though, of course, we're going to deal with just magnitudes, so this stuff will be inside of an absolute value. And for uh, this particular problem, I think they just give you an inductance and just ask to find the EMF through different regions. Yeah, so you just take your inductance, which is four Henrys, you plug that in, and then the di dt through each of the regions is just going to be the slopes. So there's actually nothing um, really crazy going on in problem number six. Um, and problem number seven now, we start to build circuits. So now that we have these three different devices, we can plug them all in to each other. And uh, when we do, things are going to get a little funky. So let's, first of all, let's talk about how an inductor will function inside of a circuit. Remember that an inductor hates change. L hates change. So what that means is if I have an inductor that has no current throwing, flowing through it, and I try to send current through it, it's going to hate that change, and it's not going to allow current to flow through. So at time t equals zero, which is to say when you connect an inductor to a circuit, what's going to happen? The current through the inductor is going to be zero. You can treat it like it's a, an open switch or a broken wire or something like that. The inductor, if it's already at a current of zero, it's going to stay at a current of zero as long as it can. It actually takes a little bit for the, the current to build up. So in the intermediate, uh, I should say, as t goes to a very long time, what's going to happen? As t goes to a very long time, uh, then the inductor will get used to the current that is flowing through it, and then you'll have uh, a current that is equal to, essentially, the voltage over the resistance, right? So if you, if you have it plugged into a resistor, then you just need to know the resistance. Um, you can also say that we're going to treat it as if it's just a wire with no resistance. The inductor itself, I should say, you can treat it like it's a wire with no resistance. And then um, in between, uh, there is a, um, a, a variation uh, that we'll, uh, we'll talk about in, in just a second. We'll talk about in problem number eight. For problem number seven, though, we're dealing only with the limits, either right when we close the switch or some long time later. So first of all, you close the switch S and they ask, what are these two different currents? Well, I know that right when I close my switch, the inductor is not going to let anything flow through it. So the current through the inductor and through the resistor that is directly attached to it in series, R3, that current is going to be zero. I1 and I2 then are going to be the same. And we can just treat our circuit as if it's just resistor one and resistor two connected in series to the battery because it's as if uh, the branch with the inductor doesn't exist right when we close the switch. After a very long time, then our inductor just becomes a wire. We can just ignore the inductor. So after a very long time, we then just have a circuit with R1, R2, and R3. It's just three resistors and a resistor circuit. And um, you can just do the loop rules with V equals IR to find uh, the currents through uh, R1, R2, and R3. You're going to want the current through R3 because once we open the switch, then what's going to happen is, because there was a current going through the resistor, so this is problem, or parts, uh, parts E and F, so we open the switch back up. When you open the switch back up, because the inductor had gotten used to a current flowing through it, remember the fundamental rule here is that our inductor hates change. So at, right after the switch is reopened, the inductor will release uh, back EMF that's equal to whatever was flowing through it initially. 
So whatever the I3 is from uh, when you do parts C and D, whatever that I3 is, that is the current that is initially going to be released by the inductor. Um, and it will be a... Uh, um, Oh, you also need to then relate that to I2, right? So that current, because the switch is open, once the switch is open, it's like the battery and R1 are no longer attached. So now you just have a single loop with the inductor, R2 and R3. And so the uh, inductor will release a current that will flow upwards through R2. And since that current is going to flow upward, make sure you have a negative sign to indicate that it's sort of going in the opposite direction to the other ones that we've done. All right, and then in, problem, in uh, parts... G and H, after a very long time, we've allowed the, the current to fully dissipate and, um, and, yeah, and now your currents have gone to zero. Because again, after a very long time, once the inductor gets used to not having a current flowing through it, uh, then the voltage will go to zero. All right. The last problem then will make use of the intermediary, the inter intermediate times. So I mentioned that these are sort of the end cases, right? Either right when you close the switch or a very long time later. These are just your two extremes. In the, in, in the middle, we have an equation that will uh, tell us how the current is going to grow through the resistor. So for problem number eight, we have uh, uh, just a, a very simple RL circuit with a resistor attached to an inductor. Um, but we are going to be asked to investigate the time sort of in, uh, in between. And so we just need an equation that's going to tell us how the current will vary. Okay, so this is the equation. Your current is... Um, uh, I of t. This is going to look like our RC circuit equation. I of t is equal to epsilon over r times 1 minus e to the negative t over tau. Our tau is going to be L over R, so I'm going to write all of that as negative R t over L. All right, so what all is involved in this? This epsilon is the EMF of the battery. That's our maximum voltage. Uh, R is going to be the resistor that is plugged into the circuit. And then we have on the other side that resistance again. We have a time, because this is a function of time, and we have our inductance right there. So we can do things uh, like, for instance, in this problem, they asked us to find uh, how much energy is delivered by the battery in the first four seconds. Well, I need to relate the energy to the current. How do I do that? I, first of all, need to define the power, which is equal to I squared R. So I'm going to square this whole thing and plug it in right there. And then in order to find the energy, remember that the power is the rate of change of the energy. So the energy that is delivered by the battery is actually going to be equal to the integral from zero to whatever time they give you of that power function. It's going to be this whole big thing. And you're going to integrate that with respect to time and then plug in the time that they give you. And that'll give you your energy. Uh, in part B, they ask for the energy stored in the magnetic field. Um, yeah, how much of this energy is stored in the magnetic field and the inductor? Well, the energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor is actually calculated using an equation uh, that looks like one that we had for capacitors. It's just that the magnetic field energy or the energy in the inductor is one half L I squared. This is kind of like your, um, you know, power equals I squared R, I guess, right? But this is energy actually directly. And this is just related to the current that is flowing through an inductor of inductance cell. So you just plug this right in. You don't need to do any integration or anything like that. You just need to find the current from our current function right here. Um, and then problem or part, part C, they ask how much of the energy is dissipated in the resistor. Um, well, we know the total energy from right here. This is the energy delivered by the battery. And we'll know how much energy is used up by the inductor. The difference between these then has to be the energy used up by the resistor because that's the only other thing in the circuit. So the energy of the resistor will just be equal to whatever this big E is that we found from our integral minus the energy that was used up in the magnetic field of the inductor. All right, and that's going to be it for this week. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to 
uh, reach on out. And uh, if not, I'll see you all later.